what did you do after you left the White House in 1960? Right, 19, 1961. Uh, yeah, for a very short time, I went up to Capitol Hill to be a speechwriter for the, the deputy Republican leader, uh, whose name was Senator Thomas Kiko of California. Um, but in a relatively short time, I got a call from Bryce Harlow. Bryce Harlow uh, was a person who had run the congressional relations for the Eisenhower administration. It was now the, the had the Procter and Gamble office in Washington, and essentially was the go-between. Anything Republican in Washington tended to go through him. He was Mr. Republican. And he came to me, um, probably the administration was over on January 20th, probably by March 1st, uh, and said um, that the Republican National Committee was concerned and something needed to be done to keep Eisenhower alive politically for their purposes. What had happened, those were the years before a former president, as it now in legislation, has all sorts of perks, housing and staff and uh, on and on and on. We know that with, with uh, uh, Reagan, we knew that forward with, with Clinton and so forth. Uh, that time it wasn't the case. Eisenhower simply got into his old car and was driven 80 miles to Gettysburg. I was given an office at Gettysburg College to, and started his memoirs. Uh, and hired his secretary. Um, so I was hired uh, to, to answer his mail. Uh, and it was, I didn't know how much bail he was getting, nor did the Republican National Committee. Uh, so we picked an arbitrary rate. I would get X cents per letter. What we didn't know was that there would be a deluge. Everybody wanted to write to who? The man who was the most popular man in the United States. Every school child wanted his help on whatever the, the debate topic of the year was. People wanted something to give to their charity auctions. People just wanted his autograph. People just wanted to say hello to him. So th it turned out to be a lot of money. And it really bankrolled my whole career as an independent writer. At the same time, Harlow said, I want you to look out for, for Nixon if he has any needs in Washington. Nixon had gone back to California. He worked for a large law firm. He was a rainmaker. He was a name that brought in business. Um, and uh, he came to Washington in the spring. It was the first time I met him. Actually, large Los Angeles law firms at that time, not like didn't have Washington offices like today. So he took an, he took a, he had a given a, an office in Bill Rogers' uh, law firm. Rogers had been the attorney general under Eisenhower, a friend of Nixon's. And he invited me in to talk about his needs in terms of his future writing. He was going to get articles for the Saturday Evening Post. He was going to have a column uh, for the Los Angeles Times. Now, I should say another thing. When I was doing all of this for Eisenhower, and, and Nixon, whenever I would see uh, that one of them had had something, like a friend of theirs had had a daughter get married, or had received an honorary degree, or had had a death in the family, I would draft little notes. Very soon in Washington, I would bump into people who say, oh, I got the nicest note from the general. People, Eisenhower liked to be called the general at that time, rather than the president. Uh, when, we sat, when I sat down with Nixon and we went over uh, all of his writing needs. And he said, oh, oh, and incidentally, don't send me the drafts of those little letters. I don't want to be remembered as a politician uh, who remembers people's birthday. This is, in a sense, the first lesson I learned uh, of Richard Nixon. After all, Eisenhower, the warrior, turned out to be a great politician. Nixon, the politician, was not necessarily so. So at any rate, I went to work in the same way for, for, for Nixon. We never had a contract on anything. I would do a draft, and he would send me a check. What I learned very quickly is that Richard Nixon was incredibly generous. He was sending me mo far more than I deserved. You know, if he would do an article for the Saturday Evening Post, they, he might get $10,000. $10,000 would be 
like fifty, sixty thousand dollars today. If I had done the same article, maybe I'd get a thousand dollars. But very often he was splitting it with me, and I said, you know, "Dick, you're paying me too much." I literally said that. And his respect, he was embarrassed, and he said, "Oh, I just have to give it to the IRS." So I was always learning things about Richard Nixon uh, at that time that I didn't know before. By the way, I should say. Uh, he was very easy to write for, which is not the case with a lot of politicians at that level who are a little embarrassed sometimes about having somebody write things for them, having a ghostwriter. But it turned out that Nixon w was admired writers. Uh, he had just finished his own memoirs, Six Crises, and he said it was the hardest thing he ever had done. He, he, he realized the difficulty of being a good writer. And he was the large, he was the major writer on six crises, uh, so he was generous, as I said. But he was easy to work for. Later, of course, when I was actually writing campaign material for him when he ran for governor, he was easy too because he had a rather distinct style. And you know, being a speechwriter, you're a bit of a mimic. I would go, if not every day, certainly often, to listen to him talk, and I would hear the cadence, and I'd be able to to imitate that. Eisenhower had didn't have that. He didn't have a style as such. All he really wanted was something that was basic, that told the facts as clearly as possible. So Nixon was really much more fun to write for.